All right, here's gonna be our Griffin build video. The Griffin is a great blaster, semi-auto, I love how it feels. For tools, you really just need some files, some basic files, and uh, if you're using socket heads, two and a half millimeter Allen key or hex key. I like to use drivers, so I don't have to manually uh, turn them by hand, which saves me a lot of carpal tunnel. So without further ado, we'll get started. I'm gonna pre-cut my wire. Um, if you get a kit from us, you'll get the similar wire lengths as well. So uh, to build a standard Griffin with some standard wheels, we've got Kraken motors uh, and a set of Kepler wheels. So we're gonna use a 14 inch length of red. We're going to use an 11 and a half length of red and a 19 inch length of black. You may need to use more depending on um, if you're doing single or dual stage or if you are doing a much looser crush of a cage, which is your motor spacing, how far apart your motors are. Uh, I'm going to be using a 41 millimeter cage, so you may have to do plus or minus half an inch or so, depending on your cage size. First thing I'll check is the fit of my parts. I'm gonna make sure that my rev trigger fits into the frame, which is flied, that's a bit too tight. So I'm just gonna take a little file and file that a little bigger. I'm also gonna pull off some of the bridging that came off a little bad. That didn't take very much. That's good enough. We want it to fully reset. Give me a little stiff. There we go. Then the second trigger, the fire trigger, of course, will test as well. That's good. And here I will then assemble the rest of my trigger mechanism. I like to start by inserting my 1 16th pin into this pivot for the gear. And I like to support something behind it so I don't damage my table and just give that a little push um, so it's sticking straight up like that. And then make sure my gear spins on top of that. If it's too tight, you wanna use a 564 inch drill bit and drill it wider, but that's perfect. My trigger should be able to actuate. There shouldn't be too much resistance between the two. It's a little choppy. So I'm gonna work it in. Yeah, that's pretty smooth. It does seem to stick right there. I'm gonna use a drop of lube. That should solve that. In addition, it could be worth it to file the top of the gear depending on your top surface print quality, and then you know follow the top of that as well, so we can get some good low friction movement. Try that again. Yeah, that's even better. Then we'll just do our trigger spring. We wanna make sure the trigger fully resets. And of course, I don't wanna lose my rev trigger. So we're gonna go fully back and fully forward. If you need to, you can stretch out the spring, make it a little more tension, or maybe shim it with something just to give it a little more springiness. Depending on what size spring you use and which files you use. Um, I've got plenty of room in there though, so I'm just going to shim it with a just the head of a screw. I like my trigger pull to be extra crisp, like so. Just like together. There you go. Yeah, even better. Nice, nice and stiff trigger pull. Full compression, you should be able to get full travel on the trigger. Then we're gonna work on some of our soldering. So I'm gonna heat up my iron. I like to solder using one of these. And we're going to remove the lever, since we don't need that. So I'm just gonna bend it up, and then bend it away. Like 
that. And we are going to solder it as follows. So my button's on the bottom. I'm going to solder it to both of these terminals here with the longer wire going on the bottom prong here, the shorter wire going on the side. Take my wire, strip it, twist it. I'm going to pin the tabs. Tin this tab. Okay, then I'm going to tin my wire. Now this is the shorter one, so it's going to go on the side. It's also the one labeled COM. And I want it to go into the direction of the button, which is going to be going down at the table. Just like that. And I'm going to actually put it on the top there of the COM, like that. Then my other red wire, I'm gonna put on the other leg, going in the same direction. So strip, oops, twist, solder, so tin. You want your wire to be fully tinned to make it a lot easier connection. I like to use about 3 8 inch of heat shrink as well on all my connections. So I'm going to pre-cut this to 3 8 Good enough. Going to do some heat shrink here. Slide that on all the way. Maybe use a little pick to help my fingers and get that heat shrink, which is already starting to shrink all the way around, there you go. Fully enclosed on the tab, a little bit of heat. This end of the other one, can use this guy, doesn't really matter. Stretch them out, get them on the tab all the way. There you go, get in there. Stretch it out. There we go. Slide it on. There we go. Found that stuff. A little heat. Okay. Now, the original design of the Griffin is to put the switch at an angle here. However, I find that that means that you're only hitting the bottom switch button just barely, which can cause some, some issues. Um, I find that sometimes it doesn't rev because you're not pushing the switch down enough. So I like to put a screw only on this bottom one here. So I'll use my 14 millimeter screw and put it on the bottom one here. I'm gonna grab a driver. And you don't wanna over tighten these because they can strip really easy because they have such a high thread count. And there you go. The rev trigger should fully reset. If not, go back and file it. And um, as a safety thing, if you pull these wires, you see how that switch bends? That's not good. However, it's better than having it bend and still be able to use it than if you did the top one and having it bend and having it be at an angle where you can't rev it at all like that. So even if I pull it really hard, I can still rev it. Um, if you want to use our modified files um, and have the switch sit just right the first time, you can do that. You will need a modified frame though and you will also need a modified scales on either side and I found this way works just fine. Um, so if you pull it, it still comes back. Not a big problem, especially once you get everything else in here, it usually holds the wires in position just fine. So then I will close that off with my trigger cover and my panels. Note, a lot of the screw holes on the original files are too tight. 
So it's really easy to strip. I'm gonna, again, support this. Push this in. Make sure that trigger still fully resets. Beautiful. So a lot of the, the holes are still too small um, in the original designs, and so you can be really easy to strip. So just make sure you um, kind of pinch stuff together and stop right when it hits the bottom. Don't over tighten it or you'll probably strip your parts. So, we'll just drive the screws just enough that it'll stay together. Same thing with this guy here. These will be eight, eight millimeters, your shortest screw. Then, at this point, I will install my mech cover. Now, the original mech cover was three pieces. The newest Griffin has one piece. I've gone through and added a wire channel to the inside because I found the wires kept pinching in the gears. So you should have a better time than most people. We're also going to use a silver pusher. First thing I do is the, uh, the longer side is a dart side or the magwell side. So I'm gonna put the other side in first, make sure it goes in smoothly and it fully goes up and down. If it's a little stiff, you're gonna have to uh, file or deburr the sides. That should just drop in and out grab it. there you go like that so then we're gonna take our black wire and the shorter of the two wires and we're gonna feed them through the if you have it the wire guide wire channel black one in and then you want the wires to come out the hole in the side of the mech cover so there's one, good enough, ah. and the red one, maybe I didn't make it quite wide enough, gotta get wide, there we go, yeah, that's good. Okay, there's two. Uh, beautiful. If you don't have the wire channel, this next step is very important. You do not want to pinch any of the wires. So we're going to put the rear end on, Make sure the wires are not pinched. And the black and the longer red wire should come out the back like that. Then when you install the front, you want to make sure that the wires go to the left of your gear. So you're gonna close the cover, not pinch any wires, and make sure your wires are going to the left. Okay, to the left. And then, since I have the wire guide, wire channel, I mean, it already sits just right. Oh, I did pinch a wire though. So I'm gonna pull the red one out so it's not pinched anymore. There you go, yeah, don't pinch anything. Okay, close it. Oh, pinch the black one, okay. And your trigger should fully reset. If it does not, then you'll have to make sure that you use a pick or a something small and skinny to get the wires going to the left. Perfect, of the gear. At this point, I like to hold everything in place by using your 25 millimeter length screw, driving that through. Make sure it goes through. It helps to kind of push in angle it to make sure the screw pops out in the center of the hole on the other side. And before it goes all the way through, I'm gonna take my hex nut, put that on the end of this hole, and then drive the screw through the hex nut. Perfect, there you go. Trigger should still reset. If it doesn't, then that means um, there's probably too much clamping force, um, causing the trigger cover to squeeze down on the trigger and the gear too much, and so you're gonna have to go through and file, again, the, the top surface of the gears. Um, or what I like to do is 
just put a drop of lube inside of the trigger guard on top of the gears to make it smoother. But this one works just fine. All right. Next is we'll put the pusher in. Now again, the pusher goes long side up, short side down first. And what I like to do is just split these part just barely to then drop the pusher in and pull it out and the pusher sets into place and you can close it. That's exactly where it needs to be. That should fully extend and reset. Again, make sure your wires are to the side though. So a lot of times it helps to grab the wires, pull them to the left, put the pusher in, or if you have a wire channel, then just use the wire channel. Then take a 25 and cap that off again. And same thing as before with a nut on the other side. Oop. Want to make sure the screw goes through the nut. If it doesn't, it can take a couple tries to go in and out. And then the trigger should again fully reset. The trigger should go all the way forward. There should be a there should not be a gap there. Get stuck. There shouldn't be a gap here, and the pusher should fully retract. Again, if you need to, go ahead and go through and file some more stuff, uh, add some more lube, whatever you need to do to get that fully resetting. It's extremely important. Everything you add could add slightly more friction that will compound and make it not work if there's too much in the end. And then I will do, I'll just do the last, or some more soldering with the XD60. The XD60 is difficult for a lot of people to solder, so what we'll do is show you what I like to do, is normally I will just strip these. These are the ones coming out the back of the blaster. Twist and tin the wires. I like to hold the wire against the solder and then kind of try to heat both at the same time. And then once the solder is attached to the iron or the wire, then just spin it around to make sure I get full coverage. Do the same to the black. And there you go. You want your wires to be fully tinned all the way around. Then for the XT60, I like to hold the iron against the brass vertically and then stick my solder between the two. Kind of pull the iron out a little bit. And once I see the solder stick to the brass, I let go. Holding it too, there too long will melt the yellow plastic connector. So I'll heat the brass, and then I'll kind of pull the iron away a little bit so I can heat the solder, put some solder in there, heat the solder and the brass, and then pull out when they're connected. Then, do not forget your heat shrink, but I will put the heat shrink on each of the wires one section onto the black, one section onto the yellow, wow, onto the red. And then what I like to do is I will heat from the side. Once I see the solder go mush, I will insert the wire through the wet solder and heat the wet solder and heat the wire on the one, give it a little push and wiggle it around to make sure my heat is fully attached. Give it a little gentle tug and we're good. So again, that is heat the brass. Now I might need more solder. I didn't use quite enough solder on the black one. So I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna heat the brass, heat the solder, add a little more solder to my brass. Once I see the solder on the brass go liquid, I will insert my wire, make sure it's all melted together, pull away, let it cool. Give it a little blow, give it a tug, and if you do a good soldering job, you'd be able to lift up an entire vise with your connection. That's a good one. And then I'm gonna let that cool a little bit before putting on my heat shrink. So I'm gonna move on to the rest of the blaster, which at this point I will assemble my magazine and, or my mag well, with a 16 millimeter and my mag release. So that just goes mag release with screw through the side. Don't over tighten this one. It needs to be 16. If it's too short, you won't grab onto the side of the plastic. If it's too long, you'll poke out the side and you'll see the, the screw protruding just like that. Okay, 
Now, another thing I found out is that I like to test the pusher in the magwell, see if there's friction. If there, if there is, then I'm gonna take a file, and then I'm gonna file the top and the sides of where the pressure goes into the back of the magwell. And that usually is sufficient to prevent the trigger from not fully resetting. At this point, I'm gonna take a half inch, the shorter compression spring. I like to stick the flat end, the factory end, or the closed end and ground end down. And then I will put, I'll hold the wires out of the way, but I'm just gonna put the handle portion, the pusher mechanism, and line up that space for the spring with the spring and push it down onto the magwell. And like always, test to make sure my pusher resets. So pusher extended, pusher reset, extend, reset. And that can actually see it, fully reset. Sometimes I like to feel it as well, just to make sure it is fully actuating and that is perfect. And then to close that off, I'll do another 25 millimeter. I like to hold everything together, kind of push it all together while I drive these screws to make sure everything is cinched down nice and tight. Make sure the mag release you know, functions. Hold everything together, push it down nice and tight. Before I cap it all off, make sure the pusher resets one last time. It does. If it does not fully reset for any any reason, go back through and check all the spots that we've checked. Then, you know, hold on a hex nut on the other side, and drive the screw all the way through the hex nut. Just like that. Still resets, we're good. Do the same thing on the second screw. Does it fully reset? It still does, hallelujah. At this point, I'm gonna work on the cage since I'm moving back front. I'm gonna put on my heat shrink though while I'm here. I'm gonna slide that heat shrink down, cover the connections with the heat shrink, and then add some heat to shrink them. Okay. Then for the cage, we're going to make sure that it is clear of debris. This came out a little hairy, so I'm gonna go use a heat gun and clean that out. I'm also gonna make sure that I have all supports removed and that the prints came out clean, the bottom came out really nice. I'm just gonna use a heat gun to remove some of those hairs on the top. I'm gonna use a file just to clean up the sides. Now the original Griffin had a really tight tolerances, so if your wheels are not sitting on just right, you may rub on your print. So we'll address that in a minute. I'm gonna use thread lock, do a really small drop in each one of these holes. One, two, three, four. Not the hole on the side, just the hole, you know, those holes. And then I'm going to put them in the cage in this orientation. I always do like that. And then I'm going to drive my motor screws I'm gonna push these motors in to make sure that I have the motor shafts and the, and the little collars going through the wells. You do not wanna over tighten these and strip your motors, but they should be flush. You just don't want them sticking out to rub on the flywheels and then I'll install my flywheels by just pressing them on. If you need to, you can support the backs of the motors with something um, and then push on with something else. Then I wanna make sure that my wheels are lined up. So when they're fully pressed on, they should be at the same height. And they look pretty dang spot on. Perfect first try. And again, um, depending on your tolerances, if you spin them, they might rub on the printed part, and we're gonna test that in a second. But what we're gonna do now is I'm just gonna tin the backs of the tabs here, so I'll just hold on to the brass, kinda tin, you know, heat the solder, heat the tab at the same time. This is gonna be a decent soldering tutorial as well. There you go. And then I'm gonna use two 10 millimeter screws, which are gonna be kind of the mid-length ones. I'll go on the bottom hole on either side of the magwell. It's kind of probably hard to see black on black, but I'm gonna drive these 
into the cage. Oh, I'm gonna switch up a bit. We're done with the Phillips for the entire rest of the build. Switch back to the two and a half millimeter hex and install that guy there. This is 10 millimeter. There you go. And another 10 on the other side. Don't, don't do this to me. Go. Okay. Then to solder the motors into the rest of it, we're going to wire it as such. Both wires gonna go through the side. And we're gonna do red on the top. So I'm gonna strip the end, twist on the top. So yeah, tin that, so it's tin all the way around and then red on the top. I, for these little ones, I like to heat the side of the tab and then push the wire through the hole in the tab. But you don't really have to do that. As long as you get a strong enough connection that you can give it a little tug and it doesn't break free, then you're good. What I'm gonna do though is kind of pull this red wire a little bit. So that way I can make that loop on that position there. So I know if I pull it gently, I can see that I need to make a connection here. So I'll just take that and with my fingernail, I like to pull to strip it, then tin, give it a little tug. Then I'm also gonna do my black wire, same thing as before. Not the most prettiest of joints, but they're pretty dang strong. Give it a push, give it a push. Okay, and then we'll do, so I also skip a step here. If you have a uh, one of those four grips that comes with the um, Griffin file set, you know, the magwell with a the grip, there's gonna be a nub here with, this, with a, a little screw port to attach that foregrip, and that's gonna get in the way of putting on your motor cover, because you have to put a screw through the middle and the bottom. So if you do have a foregrip, you have to um, assemble this part first, put the motor cover onto the cage, and then attach the cage to the body. Um, unless you have a foregrip, or if you don't have a foregrip, then you can do it this way. So I'll use my 22 millimeter, which is this guy, and I'm going to drive that through the middle here. Again, I'm gonna hold everything together because sometimes the holes can be small depending on where you got your prints from and if you're using the original files. So I'm gonna clean that hole out, put my screw in the hole, and then screw that down. I'm gonna hold these prints together so I get a good connection. There you go. And then I'm gonna use two eight millimeters and put them in here. I should note that if you are, if you're not sure about your soldering, I would test the soldering now since so we have everything connected. Um, I'm gonna do that next though after I do this bottom. I'm pretty confident my soldering was good. So I'm gonna do an eight millimeter here on the bottom. Don't over tighten these screws. I found that you can have some stress marks start to show through the print because the wall's pretty thin here on this design. Um, so just screw, hold them together and screw them down just enough so everything is, is flush and being held together. You want the screw just to be holding it in place of where it's holding. That's pretty good. Trigger still resets. A lot of times if you're soldering, you're pulling these wires without that channel, um, then you might have too much force or you might move the wires around and get stuck in the gears, but we're still fully resetting. So here I'm gonna actually test my battery while I'm here to make sure I've got everything wired not backwards and that everything resets. So the motor should be spinning the correct way. Um, if your motors are, your wheels are sitting crooked, you may get some rubbing on the cage. This came out perfect. And the trigger resets. And the flywheel trigger resets. So I'm gonna button the rest of this thing down. I'm gonna do my wire run on the side. Clean up my prints, make sure that they are perfect. Okay. Make sure those wires are tucked in there properly. Two more eight millimeter screws. Again, I'm not gonna strip these, so I'm just gonna drive the screws until everything's held together. Right there. All right, I'm just gonna tight. Let's see. 
looks good. Then I'm gonna do my motor cover. And I'm gonna make sure that things are held together that are tight. So I'm gonna do two tens here as well on either side on the top. I'm gonna hold everything together. Okay, I'm gonna make sure everything's held together nice and tight. I don't want any weird gaps in there. Then I'm gonna do two eights in the top. If you use our updated files, all of the parts, like the cage and the and which cage is which should be labeled. Makes it easier to know which is which. There you go. I'm gonna test that again and make sure that the flywheels are not rubbing on the motor cover. If they are, then you'll want to space the wheels higher or lower depending on what they're rubbing on. You may need to reprint um, your flywheel cover if it came a little warped or reprint your cage. If your motors aren't sitting flat, you may want to also adjust your motor screws. All of those things can be used to adjust things just right so that your motor should spin and not rub. If you notice that your motors spin up initially, but then they stop, if your motor stop revving for any reason at all, do release the rev trigger and go in and loosen them. Usually you'll notice that um, the motors will be stuck on the print because of something rubbed and then kind of got melted together. Then you can, um, you know, kind of grab them and twist them and break them loose and work in or break in your cage. That can help as well. But. Uh, that's basically it. Next, we'll just do our rails. Um, again, if you use our most updated files, the rail segments should be labeled because it's confusing because every single different configuration of Griffin needs a completely different configuration of rails, which is annoying. Um, typically though, you have a mech rail goes on the back, and then you have a bottom rail, which will be, the holes will be spaced off differently. And then you'll have a flywheel cover and a mag, Wow, I nailed that already. Um, cover, rail, and the orientation of the rail, actually I did that backwards. It goes this way. You can see the gaps in the rails. You wanna line up all the gaps so your rails make sense and line up. Um, but yeah, um, or you can label the rails. Or look on, I guess, the STLs um, and figure out which one is which. But essentially you'll want the slots to line up. So if you have a mech cover, you know, you'll see you've got like a half rail there. That's not gonna work. So anyway, these are all eight millimeter screws. Hold them together, don't strip them. Don't use your tens, use your eights. Let's go. Line up the hole and then You do not want to strip your prints or you'll get floppy rails. Um, there's already some issue with some of the prints or the designs being just right and not having a ton of tolerance, so your rails may have gaps between them. You could uh, use one long rail segment for the entire blaster to solve that, or use some shims or the like. Okay, worth noting also is don't strip your holes. Also, if you're using the carbine nose, the, um, the carbine nose does not quite, the rails don't line up with the new mech cover or the half-length magwell, the new magwell, um, meaning new for the Griffin release. So I've gone through and added holes as well. So you should have all the holes you need. If not, get the newest files from us or make your own holes. So you get like a teeny gap between them. If that bothers you again, use a single piece rail, get updated files from us, or or shim it with something. That's not terrible. I might replace these rails with a single piece rail. And cosmetically, you then have your flash hider, which is three more eights. One, two, three. There's some stringing on these prints. I'm gonna run them through the uh, heat gun as well to kind of give a final polish to them. A 
Okay, and then the other difficult thing to build um, on the original Griffin I found was the stock. So I made a couple of changes. First thing I'll do is I'll mount the uh, sling point loop or the buffer top to the buffer tube with more eights, so two more eights. These strip easy as well. So use modified files or just tighten them down until they cinch. And then this guy gets installed, so I'll put the XT60 through that. And then I'll line that up to the back. And then give it a wiggle so it's in place. So it lines up. And then I'll use two tens on the top and bottom and two eights on either side. Or I should say one eight on either side. So a ten on the bottom. Got a little string there. Ten on top. Eight on the side. Eight on the side. Okay, so the stock. A couple things. I found that this print can come out, well, depending on your printer, can be hard to print. So you want to make sure that the top part, the one that has like the weird little grooves in it, fits inside each one of these holes. So I like to take it and drive it in front of this hole. See, it's already really tight. Push it and twist it. And then try a different hole, twist it. Different hole, twist it. You're gonna break that in. Make sure it fits, okay? So that'll, that'll lock in now. The other thing I found is that if it doesn't lock all the way in, um, well, if it's too wide, it won't lock in, but also the release, if the release is too wide, then the lock won't have enough room to move up. So I've made this skinnier. Seems to work, hasn't broken yet. Um, but what I like to do is take the lock. Um, you've got a hole in the bottom for the spring, and then you have these kind of angled spots. So the angle spots go up, the hole goes on the bottom like this. And then I'll push it in just like that. Set that all the way to the bottom. Then I will take my release, put that in with a 22 millimeter length screw through the side of that. Tighten it just enough that it can still pivot, but the screw bites. And then I'll use one other compression spring. Um, this should be a half inch length. So I'm gonna push that in like that and push that side of the spring down. There we go. Especially not your vacuum cleaner. So when you pull the lever, it should go pretty far down and you still have enough room. We'll see. Um, but you can slide this on, push the lever, release, and you can slide it on and it should lock into place. Do firm push and you're fine. The original file had a lot of problems with it not lock locking back. Now, we just need to assemble our butt plate and we're done. At this juncture though, I'm gonna use a really small drop of super glue in this hole to then insert my square nut because I find that the square nut will fall out without something to hold it in. So I'm gonna use like the evermost little drop of super glue with the square nut in. Make sure it goes all to the bottom. So I'm gonna use like a pick or just something small and pokey to make sure that that is seated all the way down. There you go. And then the butt plate, I've also modified because I found it was a pain in the butt. No pun intended. Um, these are extra screws, but the eight millimeter is not. We'll take an eight, we'll put the hook on. And then the thumb screw should fit through this hole on top without any resistance like that. If it's too tight, you want to drill that out with a 964 or something. So that way you can still spin the thumb screw. Otherwise, you're going to be driving the screw a long ways and it's just annoying to get on and off. But this way, you can put it on. It's a lock in first. 
prints came out okay. And then butt plate on. And then you can just butt plate on. There you go. And then you can twist this thing on the back. Twist, twist, twist. Boom. Super easy. The default one was hard to get on. And there you go. There's the Griffin. Just for fun, let's do some chronograph testing. This is a default cage. I uh, believe it's 41 millimeters. These ones were not labeled. Sounds right to me. With Kepler wheels and Kraken motors. Standard 3S LiPo. Um, a fast way to test this, in case you guys are curious, is take off the stock. Make sure the, make sure the connector is loose in there so you don't just rip off the connector. Um, it can get stuck in the stock. It's kind of a large cage to fit. 44, 49, 53, there you go, 43. So average of 145, as the wheels build up more dart dust, they will improve in performance as well. So there you have it. Um, brand new, you're probably looking at, you know, maybe gaining 20, 15 FPS as your breaker wheels in. Brand new wheels are super smooth and don't grip the dart as well as used wheels, which have dart dust built up. So I bet if you fired a couple more shots, we'd see that average go up, but there you go. This is the Griffin by Flagonial. Um, great design, uh, super popular in the community. It's most popular for its size, it's small, um, great form factor, and there's a lot of things you can do with different magwells, different cages, kind of modular build. Um, some of the design aspects with the hole sizes and some other things um, could be better, but overall, a great blaster.